Uh, my, enduring Web, uh, my enduring memory of Thompson and Webb, are, there's a couple of them. Um, first of all, were his sex and hygiene talks. Uh, those were given at the very beginning of the year, maybe you remember those. And uh, uh, the sex talks were always replete with well, lots of good stories. And probably not suitable for, uh, for family viewing. Um, uh, they, they could get pretty gamey, but they were always entertaining. Um, there was at least one about uh, the father who uh, burst in on his daughter and, uh, and, his, uh, and her boyfriend and uh, with a shotgun and saying, now it's time to get married. And he <laughs> that, that always got a little bit of a giggle. Of course, he told it in his inimitable fashion. And then there were the hygiene talks, and I can't relate any stories about that, but oh boy, I mean, sometimes they got pretty embarrassing. So I remember that. I also remember that uh, Thompson never talked from the, the upper pulpit. He always used the lower pulpit. And uh, when I give my chapel talks, I follow that example. It's a good congregational kind of ethos where you're not towering over everybody else. You're speaking on their level and so on. And I always thought that was good. I really liked that about him. And of course, he never spoke from the pulpit, real, really from the lectern either. He would just kind of slouch against it, and then he'd go off onto one of his stories and one of his tangents. And that kind of slow uh, Tennessee drawl that he had, very soft, it was musical really, and, uh, and he'd tell his stories. And that's what Thompson was. He was a storyteller. And he always garnered everybody's attention because of that. Um, there's one other memory I have of him in particular, and that is it was after he retired, he still owned the campus. It was pretty plain. And we were playing a soccer game down here on the, uh, what was then, uh, the, was now the gym field. And uh, it was a varsity game. I wasn't playing. I wasn't varsity. Uh, everybody was going to it hot and heavy. Uh, 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 appeared Thompson, walking his little dog, plantation suit, broad brim, Panama hat, and he just simply sauntered into the middle of the field, going across the field, totally clueless as to what was going on apparently, and all the players just kind of stopped and gawked. It was a sight. I loved it. Uh, this is my place, baby. <laughs> <Here>. <laughs> You're just going to stop and wait till I get across. And so the little dog and Thompson Webb went across the field. As for everyday stuff, I never saw him much. You know, he was something of a remove, at least for me. And, uh, you know, to see the great man in his uh, chamber was, I think the only time I ever did that was when I came up here to, uh, you know, to look for admission as a student. Then I think I interviewed him briefly. But that was... Uh, I was in his office briefly, but that was about it. Well, as a student, um, my, my mother, who was from New England, entertained notions that I should be going to one of the poofy schools back there. And we went and visited, and I didn't like them. I didn't like the feel of them. I, I, you know, I was young. I couldn't really put words to it, but I just didn't like the feel. And then we came down to Webb, and, you know, it was weird. I was... We used to have speed bumps out there on the driveway, and we came up the driveway, and I just knew this was a place to go to school, and, uh, and that's what that's what uh, that's what's all that that happened. Uh, there was another memory as a student that I have that I really treasure. Um, you know how you kind of just go through the day and you go through the motions, and it's all kind of autonomic. Um, there was one day. I think I was a sophomore. It was the first year. I was uh, climbing up to go to the chapel, you know, the ch daily chapel. And uh, I don't know, I had a, well, I guess you could call it a Zen moment. I all of a sudden recognized where I was, very conscious of where I was, what I was seeing, the greenery, the birds, the sky, all the rest of that. I just I was really conscious of it. It was a kind of an epiphany. And I've never forgotten that moment. And I'm, uh, I remember thinking to myself, you're here, appreciate it, know it, and I did. And that mo I'm so grateful for that moment because it was uh, something I'll just take. I'll take with me for the rest of my life. 
As far as coming here as a teacher is concerned, um, I entertained notions of teaching. Again, my parents thought I would be a lawyer, so I went through the motions of maybe going to law school or applying to law school. I wound up um, going to graduate school in poli sci down here at graduate school. I got my master's um, and uh, I had a chance to teach up here. I thought I'd give it a shot from 69 to 71. I really liked it. But I had this thing about teaching without having had some taste of the real world, so called. And so between 69 and 71, I taught here. And then I left. Actually, I went to Denver and uh, did a bunch of stuff there from everything from driving taxi to selling liquor to car parts to door to door vacuum cleaners and all that kind of thing. And during summers, I worked at a local tree service here. And uh, so I got s something of a taste of the free world, but then I had another chance to teach uh, at the community college in Denver. Teach what? State and local government. I knew squat about state and local government in Colorado. An interesting bunch of students, very few youngsters. Most of them were housewives, uh, women who wanted to go back to school or do, do some school on the side. Um, there were um, professionals of one kind or another, male and female, who wanted to know something about state and local government. And here I am, you know, 20 something, you know, from California. Well, the short, the short, short end of the story is that uh, we took a lot of field trips. And actually, they turned out pretty well. And I boned up on state and local government. It was actually a pretty good class. So I did my thing at Denver, and then I got an invitation from CMC to come and teach there. Actually, I was to direct their political science honors program. And this was from, from uh, Alan Heslop, who was a very fine teacher and headed up the Rose Institute down there. Myra Heslop worked here in development, actually. So I went down there and worked for two years. It was nothing holistic about it. And that was really what drew me to web. A, I liked the age group. They were fresh. You know, they were, by and large, eager. And they were here largely because they wanted to be. Not always, but then they grew to like it. At any rate, so um, I signed up uh, in 1977. And uh, it was Fred Hooper that hired me. Well, no. Steve Longley that hired me. Fred Hooper hired me the first time. And, uh, and so I've been here ever since. But I, I'm here because I, 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 you wear a lot of hats. I enjoy being a dorm daddy. I enjoy the, I enjoy the, the extra classroom um, engagement with the students. And in fact, uh, the extra classroom engagement with the students informs the engagement in the classroom. You know, it's, you know, that, it's kind of obvious. It's, it's common sense, but it does, and it's very important. And I can do a bunch of other stuff here, you know, whether it was you know, not just teaching, but uh, you know, get involved in various kinds of activities and so on and so forth. And I like that. I like the holism, the holistic nature of the thing. I like the community. It's a tedious mantra, but it's true. This is a community, and uh, we're good at it. The other thing that attracted me to the web was the honor code. There's just absolutely no question that the most valuable, the most valuable feature of web is its, is its emphasis, its continuing emphasis on character via the honor code, the honor system, and uh, it differentiates it from almost every other school that I know of that I visited, and I visited a few. The thing, too, about our honor system is that we educate to it. It's not some sort of retributive function that we exercise when somebody's naughty. I mean, we really try to, to educate to doing the right thing. And uh, that, to me, is, is, is vital. There will be those who tell you that, uh, especially those who have been expelled, that being expelled was probably the most valuable thing that happened to them. And indeed, we had one expellee, you know, years later, he comes back, gets an honorary Bible, and has served as chairman of the Board of Trustees. That, to me, is, speaks volumes to the value of the character education that we undertake here. And certainly, it's key to me. It's, to me, it's the, core, it's the core of my being here. And it's the core, as I see it, of the school's identity. School loses that, it's lost everything.
It's just another place. The honor system, of course, in, a, in some ways is inextricably intertwined with uh, what Taylor, Cal uh, Taylor Caldwell, <laughs> Taylor Stockdale, uh, described recently as the the ethos of being nice here. Uh, nice is one of those very vague, sloppy words, but it's true. People at Webb are nice to each other, and the people who visit here, you know, the the uh, applicants who come on campus with their parents, visitors, and so on, they comment all the time about how nice people are, and we're nice to each other. And uh, when when something comes up, and it does. Uh, where you've got some people ragging on other people and so on, we address that. We address that. Hey, you know, that isn't how we do things here. Um, I, th I think that uh, I think those kinds of incidents, though, are are unusual. We get chapel talk after chapel talk about uh, friendships, about waving to people as they go by, uh, going out and stretching yourself to meet people and to grow to know people that you have no idea who they are and so on. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that's very much a component, actually, of our honor system. Of our honor system, it's a part of, you know, all of the community, the honor, the niceness. It's all bound up in the package, and in some ways you can't have one without the other. As for teachers, I had good teachers. Uh, George Ring was the math teacher. My math teacher didn't have Fred Hooper. George Ring was an ex-Marine. And uh, that was kind of how he sort of kind of ran his class. You know, he'd go into the classroom. He'd say, at ease, gentlemen. And he meant just the opposite. Now, I can't say that I was a whiz-bang in math, but, uh, you know, he was a good man. And then I had John Iverson, blackjack, we called him on the summer peppery trips. John Iverson taught history. And he was something of a model for me. You know, very intense, very intense, piercing black eyes under, you know, kind of heavy brows, very thin as a rail. He'd been wounded in World War II. And, uh, and it actually kind of lost half of his body. Uh, somehow he managed to survive, but he was kind of thin as a rail and very high strung. But boy, was he a good teacher. And uh, I did also have Larry McMillan. Larry McMillan was, was you know, he was good. Uh, my great regret, though, was that uh, I missed Lachlan McDonald. Lachlan McDonald was probably one of the finest teachers that ever taught here. Uh, you speak to any of his students, and uh, he's somewhere in the hagiography. You know, he's just ex just extraordinary. But I missed him. I would like to see somewhere at Webb a wall that uh, has the names and maybe some kind of a, a little tribute to some of the great masters here, uh, the John Iversons, the John R. Well, the John R. C. Sumner's kind of been, you know he's in the language lab, but uh, the John Iversons, the the Don Youngs. Uh, oh, Murray Alexander. Um, you know, there should be a, a faculty wall, you know, where you know people can come in like you and say, "Oh, I remember him," and uh, or somebody else much later on can come in and say, "Who that?" Take somebody like Ken Monroe. Ken Monroe taught chemistry here. If there ever was a sweetheart of a man, it's Ken Monroe. Nobody knows who he is. That's wrong. And you know, it seems to me that, you know, talk about technology, have a technology, have a wall that's got some kind of, uh, some kind of digital display of, uh, of teachers, perhaps, you know, the old guys you can't get any movies of, although you may, you know, have some kind of a, some kind of a display, a short display, and there's little screens with these guys, maybe talking about something. I mean, these are people who were great. Web school would not have made it Certainly not without Thompson Webb, certainly without Tuzan Nelson, but it wouldn't have made it without the fine faculty that they had. There should be some kind of, there should be some kind of a, a, a memorial in the best sense to those who, who had as much a hand in, in laying the bricks of this school uh, as even Thompson Webb did.
there were there were some contradictory moments. I mean, when it was all boys' school, they all complained about it, you know. And then the girls came, and then there was a kind of a backlash among some of the boys. They said they, they, they're invading us, you know. They're changing the nature and the character of the school. Blah blah blah. Well, they got over it. Um, one of the things that happened almost right away was that the boys' dress improved, <laughs> and uh, you know that was that was welcome. The first classes of girls were outstanding. I mean, I, ta I was fortunate enough to be able to teach one of the first classes, including people like Alex Rosenthal, and you know there are others. She, her name pops up right now. Really superb. Um, and so, uh, you know, in terms of the, the girls' addition to the campus, uh, they they made their place. They made their place, and uh, uh, they have been, I think, uh, an, an absolutely necessary addition to to web. And the thing is, the basic ethos hasn't changed. You know, it, it took a while for, you know, especially some of the, n the newer uh, BWS faculty members to buy into the, the system here. It took some doing for some of the old-time web faculty to buy into this, uh, buy into co-education. And there were some bumps in the road. I, I just can't stress enough what, uh, how critical Susan Nelson's contribution to Webb was, and she continues. You know. so I'm, I'm a big Susan Nelson fan. One of the things I really like about Taylor um, is that he he's preserving that that ethos, which was so much a part of what Thompson Webb was trying to do and what Thompson Webb did. He didn't try to do it; he did it. You know, he did it in his way. But um, um, Taylor and really all of the heads that we've had here, Susan Nelson certainly, can't say enough about Susan Nelson. Well, we've had other here, uh, Steve Longley, Steve Longley pre, you know, went before, way before his time. That was a real, that was a real tragedy. I mean, here was a guy extraordinarily talented, perhaps the most articulate head we've ever had, but of course he was an Englishman. He'd been educated properly. Oh, he was magnificent. And then, you know, the cancer took him. And, you know, if he'd had remained head, by golly, talk about a counterfactual history. But I have no idea how or what would have happened. You know, uh, certainly uh, the, the culture of technology has impacted us enormously. And, uh, what has happened, well, a couple of things that have happened. In terms of education, what has happened is that we have transitioned from a kind of a nation of readers to a nation of uh, viewers. That we've gone from the printed word to the graphic. And uh, in some ways, that's, it's been both inevitable and it's been good. Uh, but there are costs because... Um, you know, at some point in time, you've got to take the graphic and deal with it, and you've got to deal with it in a manner, in a, in a, in a manner that is more sophisticated and penetrating than mere graphics are, and that's the bit written word. So, um, finding the happy medium between the graphic and the written word, and educating to both, and the uh, use of both, it has been challenging, and it, it continues to be challenging. And we're human beings. We're particularly Americans are caught up in novelties and so forth, and to a certain extent, that's here. You know, I asked a question about all these digital classrooms, which you know are really marvelous. You know, when when the day is done, can they write a decent paragraph? You know, can they put their thoughts together in coherent fashion? Are they able to express those thoughts in a manner in a manner sufficiently you know that is sophisticated and sophisticated in the way that can be expressed really only in the written word? Or, you know, in the spoken word. So I'm all for digital technology and so forth. I'm thinking to myself, you know, when I retire, I may be able to go on with some teaching, maybe even here, by, via Skype or the equivalent. And I think that's just really exciting. Um, the, the, using a, using a te technology in the classroom, for example, yesterday, I know this is a minor thing. I use a smart board all the time. I throw, I, I, my kids no longer send homework assignments hard copy. They all have to do it digitally, and they have to know how to use the applications. Using Word, 
using Excel, doing all those sorts of things, very basic stuff. But yeah, they got to learn that stuff. You know, they, do, they need to know it. Yesterday in the classroom, as I was saying, we did Digital Jeopardy. And the kids were really engaged, and actually the alumni really enjoyed it, and so on and so forth. So yeah, it's good. Humanities and technology are not mutually exclusive, obviously, but uh, you know, we have, I think the, the, the I think the the uh, distinction I would make would make once again is between that which is visual and technology deals with a lot that is visual. Yes, it, it allows you to do the printed word too, but mostly technology it seems to me is about uh, seeing people uh, be doing face to face and all that kind of stuff. It's between visuals and the word. One of the reasons is that the King James Bible, um, the King James Bible is as lovely as it is. It, because as, uh, the reason that Shakespeare, which is contemporary with the Bible, is as ex, uh, you know, kind of a pillar of English language and culture as it is, is that the English that England at that time was the nation of the word. It's it, they had their cathedrals of stone, you know, but they had their cathedrals of words, and that's what the King James Bible was, and in a certain sense, that's what Shakespeare was too because everybody was attuned to the word. If you remember your U.S. history and Puritans, the Puritans were a people of the word, and they imbibed that from, they imbibed that from, uh, from the Jews. The Jews are the people of the word. We're not so much a people of the word now, and, you know, and that's, that's a real tension in our culture intellectually, um, intellectually, culturally, whatever. Well, people like you, um, you know, your students, you know, somewhere in the dim distant future, there, there, you know, there might be a name on the wall or something like that. But the the legacy is really kind of intangible. You know, you know how a ripple is. Uh, the ripple is there, and then it's it's smaller and smaller, and finally you can't see it, but it's still there in a variety of ways. You know that it bangs up against a little rock and washes a grain of that a grain of pit maybe a little bit of that rock away or whatever or adds to it. That's 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 the legacy. Well, my hope for it all is that they maintain the ethos. I mean, I you know there are all kinds of permutations and combinations of possibilities, but uh, there's got to be the constant, and the constant is the ethos. The honor system, the community spirit, the niceness, um, and you know, to a certain extent, you know, the sense of mission that goes along with that. And the sense of mission has got to remain the same. The ethos has got to remain the same, and then all the other stuff, you know, all the other stuff is uh, ancillary.